the story of the San Francisco Giants is legendary. In my years as the official voice of the Giants, I've had the privilege to meet countless players and personalities whose passion for this team is only matched by their love for the game. Their stories are intertwined within the fabric of this team's history. They are Forever Giants. High and deep to right, and this baby is Nate Shearholtz grew up in the Bay Area watching legendary giants like Barry Bonds and Will Clark. Undrafted out of San Ramon Valley High School, Shearholtz spent one year at Chabot College before the All-American was picked up in the second round of the 2003 MLB Draft by his hometown team. During his career, he helped Team USA win a bronze medal in the 2008 Olympic Games. Two years later, he helped the Giants win their first championship in 53 years. Nate Sheerholz will always remain forever Giant. And we have returned to beautiful Silver Oak, Alexander Valley, and my guest today on Forever Giants is Nate Sheerholz. Thanks for joining me for our show. Thank you so much for having me. It's, it's an honor. good to see you. It's great to see you, too. So good to see you. Well, let's take it from the top. Talk to me about your, um, your upbringing in the East Bay and how you actually found your love for the game. Well, I lived in Huntington Beach for the first six years of my life, and we moved up in 1990, shortly after the earthquake. And I, so for some reason, I chose the Giants over the A's. I'm not quite sure why, but <laughs> the orange and black just which was a better fit for me. And, right. and uh, I remember going to games at Candlestick, Candlestick you know, yeah. freezing myself there. Yes, we all did. <laughs> but I, I just developed a passion from baseball all the way back to three years old. I can remember my parents throwing me pitches against the, the garage. And, that young, and it, really? just, it just came natural to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I excelled at it and, and I felt like I stood, stood out in T-ball and that's kind of where I started to love the game because I think anything that you're successful at at a young age you you know grow to love and from as early as I can remember from early elementary school I wrote on every paper I'm going to be a major league baseball player one day Wow! and I really believed it even though I didn't put pressure on myself um, you know my parents both worked a couple jobs and you know struggled to make ends meet and it was tough but I just learned that there's no other way than working hard. So I uh, put in the time and, and everything worked out well. So they must have been really supportive and probably sacrificed a lot for you, right? To, to, to have this journey to Major League Baseball? They did, they yeah. did. Um, my dad coached me up until I was about 12. Mm. And then he went on to my other two brothers. But, you know, my mom was always working. He was working a lot. And, and uh, in a sense, you know, I was like a, almost like a parent to my brothers. So mm. we, I spent a lot of time with them, helping them grow up, and we spent countless hours playing wiffle ball, uh, baseball together, yeah. other sports out other in the street. Sports, yeah. We were street kids. I mean, <laughs> street kids in Danville, in Danville run, right. running around. I mean, not getting into too much trouble, but we were just, it was sports, video games, going to the talking baseball, the baseball card shop there. Like everything, I mean, I read the, the Sporting Green, the Chronicle, every single morning. Oh, you looking, were into it, man. I was looking at all the players' stats every day, and that's yeah. probably why I like math now. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. But, yeah, I fully immersed myself in baseball yeah. from a young age and just grew to love it. Went from an undrafted player in high school with, you know, a few scholarship offers to getting drafted in the second round by the Giants after my first year at Chabot. Okay, talk to me about drafted Incredible. by your childhood team. Are you kidding me? I, I remember it like it was yesterday. Do you? Tell me. I was sitting in the house I grew up in in Danville, and this was still dial-up internet. I mean, <laughs> it was like there were 10 picks had gone, and I'd refresh, and like you'd see 10 more, and it right. wasn't like, you know, fast like it is today. Uh -huh. But I just remember seeing, you know, 63 pop of the, sec of the second round, and my name was next to SF, and I jumped up and down. Did I was you? so excited. I remember all my buddies came came over and oh. I had my you know some of my coaches from childhood there and it was a big celebration it, it took quite you. a while for it to sink in did it I think it I remember Bobby Evans invited me out to a game shortly after that and 
we sat in the bleachers and it was like the first experience where I was like, this could really be a reality one day, me playing here. So amazing. it was amazing. And then you make your, um, your major league debut, June 11, 2007. Do you remember that day at all? Absolutely. Uh -huh. I was so nervous. Were you really? <laughs> I was pretty nervous the whole day. As soon as the game started and I was in the dugout, the butterflies kind of went away. Uh -huh. And I came in that game to replace Barry Bonds as a defensive replacement. Hello, you know, no big deal. Awesome, <laughs> yeah. I mean, they gave me the lineup card and everything. I'm like, this is oh, so cool. Oh, that's so cool. Which I eventually lost in my parents' house fire. It, oh, Yeah, sorry. when their house burned down, which was a huge bummer. Oh, I'm sorry. But, I started the next day, and actually the night that I started my first game, or I came in as a replacement, of course the first fly ball from Troy Gloss found me. <laughs> <laughs> that always happens that way. You right. come into a game and then you're, you better be ready. So luckily I made that out and then got my first hit out of the way the next, the first at bat the next day. So I got my first taste and obviously that was amazing. And, and then followed the next year with the Olympics and just, it's kind of how the career got started. I love how you just throw out the Olympics, like it's just something that happens every day. It's top but two in my whole, it's I've got be like right? a list of, you know, career achievements and favorite days. And the Olympics is very close to the World Series it title. It has got to be, it right? It was just such a different experience. So special, so humbling to play for your country. And I can't imagine. And then to take home a medal was just, it was icing on the cake. Y'all got a bronze medal, we right? Did. And this was in China. Mm -hmm. You had a really very memorable situation in a preliminary game. Can we, can we talk about that? I did. <laughs> <laughs> there was a tooth that got chipped. There was an emergency root canal. Tell oh, yeah. the story, Nate. <laughs> China so, was upset with him. <laughs> yes, of course, the Olympics was in China. <laughs> and we were playing China Oh, geez. Um, in one of the first rounds. And they weren't too strong of a team. But it was the Olympics. and. Any team can beat any other team on any given day. So we got in a beanball war. I end up on third. One of our guys hits a short sack fly. It was way too short to have gone home, <laughs> but I knew I could run a little bit once I got going. And I said, it's the Olympics, We're, I gotta go. And the catcher, he blocked the plate completely. And I wasn't gonna slide through that and get hurt. So I. I lowered my shoulder and as Steve Holm would say, it was a yard sale. His <laughs> stuff went everywhere. <laughs> and they got a, a couple of great pictures of it, you know, that yeah. were put on like postcards for the Olympics <laughs> while we were there. And I mean, the media was all over it. Yeah. Their manager came out um, who was, you know, an American and he was in my face, the catcher was in my face. I got quite a lot of backlash from that. Yeah. I didn't really care from my perspective. Yeah, I was gonna I say, was, how did you deal with all of that? It was like an international crisis. I play hard, it's part of the game. Right. And I wanna win a gold medal. That, I mean, that was my, <laughs> where I was coming from. And I mean, people on the street were saying, oh, our whole country hates you right now. I mean, I was getting <laughs> from- terrible. Yeah. <laughs> so it created quite a commotion, but it was- uh, It was worth it though, it you got a bronze medal. Yeah. yeah, it was an amazing experience. Yeah. I mean, the experience off the field was, equal or better to the experience on the field. Really? Walking around the Olympic Village and, you know, seeing Michael Phelps and having a massage and waking up in Kobe's next to me. Meeting. Wait, what? Oh yeah, that happened. <laughs> that happened? <laughs> yes. Oh my. And LeBron um, was there too, wasn't he? Oh yeah, I've got a great picture of LeBron. Oh my I mean, goodness. towers over me, he's a monster. Sherholtz hits a high fly ball to deep right. Cuss back. Cuss not going to get it. Up against our tray number seven. Sandoval scores. Aurelia scores. Here comes Sherholtz. He's going to score. Wow. Yeah, that, that inside the park home was special. Have to tell me about I that. enjoy watching that video. Do you watch it like a lot? Yeah. <laughs> nah, not a lot, but every now and then. Often you pull that, that one I've out. Now that I've got, you know, a couple kids, they're young, but they Look like. What dad did. Yeah, I like to throw up the YouTube sometimes. And <laughs> <laughs> can you, can you kind of walk me through that? Because, I mean, 
the energy in that place was crazy. It was and crazy. What, you, yeah, were you, were energy, you kind of present in that? Did you feel that? or? 100%. Uh -huh. The energy at former AT&T Park uh, was, was second to none. I mean, that was one of my favorite parts about playing in San Francisco. Mm. Not only was it being a fan and getting to have my family and friends, you know, see me whenever they wanted, mm -hmm. but the atmosphere, the uh, just how loud the crowd would cheer, especially, it was great hitting a home run or hitting an inside the park home run, but throwing someone out or making a big defensive play and being in right field and feeling the wave of, of just how loud the fans were, it's, I can't describe it. And I feel like that was part of leaving the game that was so hard oh. that I would never like feel that or hear that again. Oh, yeah. Although during, um, you know, Bruce Bochy's send off, oh. that was pretty neat to be announced again and, and hear that again. And the fans here are just awesome, yeah. second to none. Since we, we brought him up, just tell me about playing for him and, and the impact that he had on you as, as a manager. I mean, he's like a player's manager and mm -hmm. just he's just a decent guy to begin with, but tell me a little bit about your relationship with him. I learned so much from him. Mm -hmm. um, I remember, you know, when we signed Aaron Rowan, who became a good friend of mine, mm. he called me in the off season, which I thought was really just Class awesome, act. Classy to yeah. call me and say, look, you know, don't lose any confidence. You're still one of our guys, um, still train hard and be ready. And that was kind of one of the first things I remember, um, you know, and I, I just have a tremendous amount of respect for him, for how he treated everyone, for how he managed the game, for how well he was at, you know, manip manipulating the lineups and mm -hmm. making pitching changes better than anyone. Mm -hmm. If I was a GM, it would be hard. If I was an organization, it would be hard to not say he'd be my number one pick. Yeah. But he, uh, he always kept me on my feet. I think that he and I, at times maybe disagreed on when I should or shouldn't have played. I obviously was competitive and I, my goal was to come out and play every day and my playing time wasn't always what I hoped it would be. Sure. But I stayed ready, he taught me patience, he taught me to deal with pressure because there were times where it would be the first inning. I remember Randy Wynn fouled the ball off his foot. Nate, you're in, mm -hmm. like, I mean, it, you gotta stay it, ready. Always ready. Yeah. And that ended up being a game where Jonathan Sanchez threw a no hitter. So it's well, like, there you go. Yeah, which, which was great to be a part of. <laughs> Wasn't too. that something that was so extraordinary? It was. It was. It was just the beginning of all those amazing years of pitching, and uh, just being so fortunate to play behind such an incredible staff that we may not ever see again, yeah. especially homegrown like it was. Yeah. Exactly. So Boach, yeah, he was he was just awesome to play for and uh, yeah, I have so much respect for him and everything he did for the Giants and the game. And, yeah. and I just like how he, he really appreciated the hard work. And I think that he respected the way I played and, and I left it all in the field. And um, That's I, knew, all you I, can do. I knew he valued that. Yeah, so absolutely. It absolutely. meant a lot to me. Well, let's talk about the 2010 postseason. How about that experience? Just, a dream come true. Yes, it, I yeah. know. You're growing up in Danville. You're rooting for the Giants. I've rooting for the Giants my whole life. Man. Um, it was crushing in the early 2000s when they lost. And Dude, you're telling me? Oh, it was so close. <laughs> I know. I we don't those. even talk about 0-2. No, no, but I mean, that's kind of how far I went back. Yeah. And that's, that was how much 2010 really meant to me. And Could you believe that you were... <laughs> no, I was so locked in, and it was like our team was so much fun on and off the field. We had one goal, and, you know, no matter how many guys came in or left that season, we all were able to put it together, and we didn't have the best team. I mean, we had the best staff for sure. Yeah. But um, And that's a testament to Bochi, mm -hmm. how he got you all to play together as a unit. Absolutely, yeah. 100%. Yeah. And so that was, I mean, we just started rolling and the magic really happened. I mean, it, it just kept getting better and better. And, you know, Cody, I think that's when it really became real was in the NLCS when, you know, Cody took holiday deep twice. 
and the Phillies were tough. And yeah. I mean, that team, on paper, you would have said we had no chance. I know, right? Or not much of a chance. I know. Well, but, that's what everybody was saying through the whole postseason, mm-hmm. and you guys just kept rolling. Yeah, Cody got us started, and then it was like Uribe had that huge homer to send us to the World Series. And it was such a fun team. So yeah. many characters. <laughs> I was kind of like the low-key guy who... <laughs> You know, I did my thing on defense and, and uh, was ready whenever I was called upon. But yeah. it was so much fun to be a part of. And So you were able to enjoy it and kind of oh, be yeah. present in that whole experience because it can be overwhelming, I would imagine. Too. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't – a lot of those guys were getting hounded. And uh, I was kind of in the background mm-hmm. for a lot of it, you know. Mm-hmm. I was coming off the bench. I got one start, which I'm incredibly thankful for. Um, behind Bumgarner in game four of the World Series that I'll never forget. Right. And we just rolled. And honestly, one of my favorite parts of that whole thing was the parade. Like that was just, just from being from the, the Bay Area and never having gone to a parade like that before, knowing that the Giants hadn't won in San Francisco. Right. It was, it was just, it was, that will be in my heart forever. That parade was <laughs> insane, was it not? It was insane. Yeah. I'll never forget just yeah. the seas of people, the rows and rows. You couldn't even see the streets. I know. And for blocks and blocks. You didn't even use batting gloves until like 2011? I didn't, no. What, what was that about? Tell me about that. I lived on the Iron Horse Trail, which in the East Bay, it's just like a long path. And we, we would we mowed basically a baseball field on this trail nice. and we played every summer baseball gloves just they didn't even exist to me right. growing up yeah and it was just a thing that i never really wanted and didn't get used to and still until i became a little older and realized that those games in the summer in San Francisco can be freezing yeah. and there's no grip when you're just grabbing dirt yeah. as grip and you could so, use a little help I kind of switched over eventually, (laughs) but I like keeping it old school. No batting gloves, socks up. Yeah. You know, like the old JT Snow way of doing it. So exactly. Yeah. That's so cool. So, and you also uh, played in Japan a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. How was that experience? It was a, it was a great. You've been all over the place, man. And I'm very thankful for that. I mean, as much as it would have been nice to spend my whole time in the in the big leagues, um, Japan was you know another experience that I won't forget. The baseball there is difficult at times, and it's a different game. Yeah, a completely different game. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, I had fun um, after the first the first month was difficult, just transitioning into a country that speaks very little English, mm-hmm. especially in Hiroshima where I was. But after the first month, I had a couple American guys on my team um, and Jesus Guzman, who actually played in San Francisco a bit, who kind of showed me the ropes and taught me how to order off of a menu where there's no English. (laughs) That's good. But I grew to love the country. Mm -hmm. The people are so, so nice. It's super safe and the food was incredible. And our owner was awesome. Like he would send, he would send us to dinners. He would send all the American guys, he sent like a, an igloo cooler for to each of our lockers after the game as like a surprise. And it would be like, you know, 20 Kobe steaks from, from Kobe, which is like right there yes. that I would take home and, and you know, throw on the grill, God, what's like steaks a, that I've oh never had in God. America. Right. So right. it was their, their hospitality was just off the charts and, and, um, they just have such a respect for baseball. They and, do. And they they are nuts about it over there. They love the it passion. so much. Every yeah. game there felt like a playoff game here. Really? So to go wow. from a couple down years with the Cubs to the playoffs with the Nationals and losing to the Giants and then to Japan, it, it was it was a nice change up to uh, be in front of fans who gave it a playoff like atmosphere. That's cool. That's yeah. really cool. So Even t- though I may have not have known what they were saying. <laughs> <laughs> but you felt And they called their- me NATO. NATO. So they had a, they, yeah, my name in Japan was NATO. So they had like a chance for me and everything. NATO. Oh, yeah. NATO. They're, they're loud. They're that must have games. been cool though, right? Oh yeah. Anyone who's in Japan that's a baseball fan should absolutely go to one of the games there you would recommend that definitely yeah yeah yeah. well tell me about 
life after baseball and how was that tough for you to very very difficult yeah the first year or so um it was such an adjustment from you know playing really my whole adult life for 14 years and then going from not having a spring training again to not having you know a structured schedule where i was expected to be somewhere every day from mm. whatever one or two to 10 or 11 p.m. It was it was tough. Um, I was you know, ball players are gone every other week. Yeah. And I was home every day, and so there was an adjustment to, yeah. you know, in every way. And um, it was it was tough. But the one thing that really helped was my daughter. And now I've got a daughter and a son. But my wife was pregnant while I was in Japan, and that oh, wow. ended up being really my last full season. Mm -hmm. And so the timing worked out great where we started having kids right when I was done and, and they're everything to me. Yeah. So yeah, I've got well, a Well, that was a blessing for you then. It yeah, was, it was. Way. Yeah. I, I, you know, I uh, am f so fortunate that I get to spend a lot of time with my kids now and, and juggle a little bit of real estate and, and investing with a couple partners on the side. But, um, I'm also going to school. I'm Are also, you really? I'm, yeah, I'm uh, going to Northeastern. I'm finishing my degree basically in business management. Yeah. Because education was always, you know, up there for me. And, and um, oh, that's great, I think man. it'll be great for my kids to see that I finished school when I didn't necessarily have to. Absolutely. And I don't want to be limited in the future by right. opportunities by not having, having a degree. So it's been... Uh, it can be a grind some days, but I enjoy it. And um, you're a businessman now and a daddy. Yeah, and... I'm just trying to learn as much as I can. I've got yeah. a real estate license in Arizona, so I do that on the side and and uh, really just enjoy spending time with my kids. Thank you so much for sharing so much with me about your journey, and I really appreciate it. And you are forever giant. And as we end all of our shows, we have a we have a lovely toast. So, it's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. It's great Thanks to see you, me. Nate. Thank you. NATO. <laughs> it's here for NATO. Thank you so much for joining me. It's just been such a treat. It's Thank a pleasure. You. Thanks. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers, everybody.